So let's start uh, with our next highlight today. So our next speaker will be uh, Professor Aude Biard from uh, EPFL in Switzerland. She's also associated with the Swiss National Competence Center for Research in Robotics. She is an expert in the field of human robot interaction, has been working for many years in this field. And in particular, she is a pioneer of what is called learning by demonstration. And it is clear that in the future, we do no longer want to program our robots, but we just want to show the robots or tell the robots what they should do, and then they will do what we want. Uh, now, uh, today, she is going to talk about how the body shapes the way we move and how humans can shape the way robots move. And I said, you know, this is a really cool title, of course. And uh, then all said, well, you know, cool title is one thing, but saying something cool in the talk is even more difficult. So we're very much looking forward uh, to your lecture. Thank you for coming, Odd. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rolf. Actually, that's a cool title, but that's really your title. So, um, so I borrowed a little bit um, some of the ideas that you had in your own title. And I wanted to narrow it down to programming by demonstration or learning from demonstration um, and what it means to have the body uh, shape the way we move and how that influence the way that we want to control robots in the future. Um, so first of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to talk to this very large and, and wide crowd, and I, I look forward to, to the questions that I expect to be very diverse. Um, so if I turn to the, to the talk itself, um, yeah, I phrase it into two questions. The first one is how the body shapes the way we move. This is one, I mean, one example of this uh, so-called embodied intelligence, um, and it's the fact that the body uh, is directly connected to uh, an optimal way of controlling systems. And so what I mean by that, I, I'm relating to this, uh, this very large uh, evidence in biology that evolution has shaped the body and the control system simultaneously. And of course, this has been uh, probably discussed at large during uh, the various lectures of, of this particular class. Now, I like these two images because they challenge uh, a little bit this view. Um, typically, birds are not meant to walk the way that we're seeing this bird walk. Neither are cats redesigned uh, to be able to fight the way this cat, uh, this cat is, uh, is fighting. So their, their body and their controller have been designed uh, for a very different uh, type of uh, locomotor pattern, um, whether it's flying or, or running or jumping. And humans, on the other hand, um, have a body that, uh, that will be particularly suited for doing these two particular tasks that we're seeing um, the bird and the cat doing here. Now we know, and this is also, again, uh, little funny pictures to, to challenge this idea that the, the body and the mind are, are really designed to do one specific task. If we want to, we can obviously have our body uh, do things for which they were not designed in the first place, for which they are not optimal. And that's really thanks to the fact that our controller are very adaptive and very flexible, and so are the controllers of uh, most animals. But so if we turn to robots, uh, clearly we'd like to have the design of the body match a little bit what we'd like the robots to do in the first place. Um, so we don't want to have to stretch then the controller um, to the extent that it has to have the body of the robot to do things for which it was not designed in the first place. And again, this is nothing new. This is something that probably has been discussed at length in the, in the various lectures of this course. Now, if I narrow it down to the problem that I'm interested in, which is having robots in the long run that will help us in our daily environment. So I really narrowed that down to the idea of having a robot that will be in, in our homes or in office space, and that will help us do some of our daily chores. Um, if we just take a simple example like just riding, which is not a chore itself, but gives a good illustration of the need to have or not have robots that look like humans. So a lot of people argue that uh, there is not a need to have a robot like on the right hand side, which will have a very complex hand that looks very similar to the human hand. Um, this is the ICAP robot. It has a nine degrees of freedom uh, hand. Uh, and can hold a pen in a way that is very similar to the way a human would hold a pen. But on the left-hand side, what you have is a very simple gripper with just two degrees of freedom, which is also holding uh, a pencil here in a very stiff manner and will, in principle, be able to do the same task um, 
at the lower cost uh, of number of degrees of freedom. Now, what I want to argue is that we actually need to have arms and hands that are similar to human hand, hands and arms if we want robots to do tasks um, that are similar to the tasks that we are doing in our daily environment. Why? Well, first of all, because most of the furniture we have are designed for us. Um, there is a lot of work done on so-called ergonomics um, that design uh, objects meant for the human hand. They're really designed on the shape, um, the way you can handle them, like we see here for the toothbrush, uh, any of these cups, even for babies, they're, they're made, they're, they, you have different designs typically of cups uh, for children that follow the growth of the child's hands. And so there is a lot of thinking uh, put uh, into the design of not just uh, little tools like those, but also any of the furniture we have at home um, so that they are sort of so-called bent to our needs. So we want to have a piece of furniture that are easy for us to use. And it's to the extent that if you have somebody who is very tall or somebody who is very small, then these people have struggle to just use furniture that are typical of uh, houses. Cupboards are often too high for these people or too low uh, on the other side. And um, even left-handed people find it a little more difficult to handle things uh, on an everyday use than, than right-handed people. If you look at door handles, they are designed for right-handed people. So there is a lot of the design that is meant for the human hand. If you look at the robotic hand, and we have a couple in my lab, they usually have fingers that are just too wide uh, for just uh, being able to handle any of these, uh, these handles on, on cups or any of these objects. So it seems like the design of robotic hand at this, at this stage is not meant really for robots to handle uh, uh, tools uh, the way humans handle them. So I, I want to advocate uh, that we need to have robots that have arms and hands in particular that are very similar in terms of uh, shape, size, but also the force that they can apply on objects. They should not be too strong, neither too soft. They should have the same range of force and same range of degrees of freedom as the human hand because the furniture are designed for the human hand. And I'd like to, to now move to, to a couple of examples um, of work that, uh, that we've, we've tried to do in, in, the, in that direction in my lab. So I'm not talking here about the design itself, but how we can then exploit um, the design of a hand that is similar to the human hands to achieve um, uh, the dexterity uh, that we find in the human hand. So here we have on the right-hand side the ICAP hand, uh, which has a total of nine degrees of freedom. Uh, but if we just consider the thumb, the index, and the middle finger, we're controlling here are a subset of five degrees of freedom. So typically in grasping, which is a wide field in robotics, uh, people will look for finding the so-called optimal set of grasping points. And usually uh, there is a single optimum. So they will solve a relatively complex nonlinear problem and find a global optimum uh, whereby you can determine explicitly the position of the finger, the thumb, the index, and the middle finger so that they're optimal according to some cost function. So if we just take a very simple um, object like this one, the optimal placement is having the thumb opposite to the two other finger and uh, just around the center of mass of the object. So that will give you this type of, um, of, uh, of shape for holding object. But I want to argue that humans actually very rarely use this so-called optimal posture. In fact, the true dexterity of human hands is to have many different ways in which we uh, handle objects. Um, you can see here an example where we put um, the fingers not opposite to hold that object um, because uh, that frees out, in fact, space for us to drink from this cup. We also often place the hand here um, on that object at the very top of the object, even though it's very far from the center of mass, which usually is pretty low there, because we want to make sure that we are uh, having the lid uh, closed. We also often hold object at the very uh, tip, at the bottom tip or the top tip, when we're passing over an object to someone else, because this is a polite way uh, of, of passing object. And most importantly, we often hold object at the very tip here or at the very bottom, because that frees also space for holding other objects with the other degrees of freedom. And that ultimately, that's what we want also when we design a robot hands that have multiple degrees of freedom, is to be able to manipulate more than just one object. And in this case, the classical way of solving for just a fixed number of grasping points will not apply for this particular um, handling of objects here. 
So we took the avenue to be able to um, classify and, and get all of these uh, various ways of holding objects. So as opposed to look for the optimal way of holding an object, we wanted to be able to find all the feasible grasp. So it's, we're not looking for the optimum, the single optimum, but rather all the solutions that are feasible and not necessarily optimal, suboptimal. And we, here what you see is the ICOB in, in simulation uh, that is holding objects in a way that is very similar to the way humans hold objects. So here we, we started just with a cylinder and we have the finger um, holding the object at the very bottom which, with a, a wrist which is turned upside down. And this is very similar to the way uh, the human hand is holding objects when we are pouring the content out. We find here again the same grip as I mentioned before, holding the object as we're passing it uh, to somebody else from the bottom or from the very top. And here, uh, this is a particular grasp that enables to free out the remaining two other fingers to hold other objects. Now what was interesting was to show also that this particular grasp um, can be used as a pre-shape uh, to hold other objects that are not cylindrical. In fact, we could, uh, we could show that um, this, um, this sort of taxonomy of grasp will reduce to 20 grasp in total, and this could be used as pre-shape to hold a variety of objects, which I've seen before. I'm sorry. Okay, we have them here, and so typically we have the grasp here for that particular object. We can hold also other very tiny objects, placing the finger on both sides symmetrically, or even complex objects like this. So just to, to wrap up this part of the talk, um, I want to argue the fact that the, the body shapes the way we move and the a robot hand that is similar to the human hand can produce a variety of grasp that is very similar to the variety of grasp that we have on daily objects, which if we were to use a non-human hand, and here I give an example, this is the Barrett hand, which has three degrees of freedom, and it's very similar in principle to most of the industrial robotic hands that we, we can find here. Um, it can um, produce a much smaller variety of grasp on objects, and if we see the implementation of this grasp on, on daily objects, then this does not resemble the grasp that we as humans will do. In fact, it has a lot of uh, difficulties to just uh, grasp the object by the handle, again, because of the sheer um, um, size of the, of the finger and, uh, and also just the, the positioning of the finger themselves, which does not give enough degrees of freedom. So I'd like now to, to move to the, the second part of the talk. Um, how can then humans shape the way uh, robots move and why would you want to have that? So I argued the fact that we want to have robots uh, that have arms and hands that are similar um, to the human hands and arms. Um, but I'd like to argue further that we should have robots that move and act in a way that is similar to the way humans move and act. So why would we want that? Well, there are two reasons for that. The first one is that if robots move the same way as we do, then it will make um, the robot's motion more predictable. By more predictable, I mean by that that if the dynamics is similar to the dynamics of human motion and animal motion in general, we are used to these dynamics, so we can better predict uh, where the robot will move next. So it will increase the safety during human-robot interaction. Classically, robots are controlled um, with uh, fixed speed, so basically they will accelerate and then move with constant speed and decelerate. And often they accelerate extremely rapidly, then they move constant speed and decelerate. Or you have other typical type of profile where they have a constant acceleration, constant deceleration. This is very non-human-like, and it can be very startling for somebody who is not used to the type of, um, of behavior, because you have a robot that suddenly accelerates and then moves the constant speed, which is much slower than the acceleration, and then decelerates extremely rapidly. Uh, so this is, in a way, relatively dangerous, and, and need, you need to have people getting accustomed to that. Animals and humans have a tendency of moving with the same type of uh, dynamics. So it is a constant uh, acceleration. You have a peak of the velocity at midway of the move, movement, and then we decelerate slowly um, to reach a zero, um, zero velocity at the target, typically in reaching movement, but in most of our hum human movements. So uh, there is also another reason is that if we can better uh, predict how the robot will move, then we can also better collaborate with the robot. So if the robot starts handing something to somebody else and it does it in sort of a natural dynamics of motion, then I can better predict where the hand will, will arrive and then I can move um, in the direction that, that the robot is pointing to. 
But another reason for having robots move the same way as humans do, obviously, and that's something I'm sure that's, uh, that's been covered in previous lectures, is the fact that the human motion have all these nice properties such as robustness to perturbation, smoothness, energy efficiency that we like robot motion to have. So I'd like now to turn a little bit to this notion of robustness to perturbation. Um, what does that mean to be robust to perturbation, and why do we say that humans are so robust to perturbation? And if we are, then can we find ways um, to learn to adapt uh, the same way, so for robots to adapt the same way as humans do? And first of all, why would we want to do that? Again, for the same reason as I mentioned before, if robots can adapt to perturbation the same way as humans do, they may again be more predictable, and the reaction will be less dangerous for humans. Imagine that you're working together in the kitchen with a robot uh, that is helping you doing a daily chore. And the robot is startled by the fact that you do something that is different from what the robot planned you to do. And if the robot has itself a reaction to, to this perturbation, so if you bump into the robot and the robot suddenly um, starts accelerating in a direction that is totally unnatural to you or is, uh, or is stopping all of a sudden, that will startle you even, even more. But if the robot avoids obstacles or reacts to perturbation a way similar again, with a dynamic that is similar to human dynamics, also taking a direction for avoiding obstacles that is similar to what humans will do, then again, this makes, uh, it more, this makes the interaction safer because you can better predict uh, what a robot will do um, if, if something goes wrong in, in their interaction. So I'd like to take uh, a couple of examples to illustrate uh, what I mean by learning uh, from the way human adapts to perturbation and, and putting that into the control of robots. So I'd like to start first with a very simple example uh, based on what I showed before. If we go back to this idea of having a grasp, which is optimal in a classical sense. So you hold here an object with, uh, again, this opposition of the thumb with the two um, outer fingers right uh, around the, the center of mass of the object. And assume somebody comes and slightly tilts uh, the object sideways. What you like the robots to do is exactly what we're seeing in this picture. You like the robots to adapt the positioning of the finger to adapt to the new position of the object. But these now new position of the fingers are suboptimal. So you like the robots to move from this uh, globally optimal uh, posture to suboptimal other posture in a smooth and natural manner. Um, so how can we uh, get a robot to do that in a natural manner? First of all, here is a video, if you can play it. Uh, this is a video of typically what would happen if the robot was very stiff. So here we have a typical robot that wants to stay in this optimal posture, and as you keep perturbing um, the original posture of the, um, uh, of the finger, then they will just, in a non-stiff, in a very stiff manner, come back to the original posture. Now, here is a video. Can we switch to the next video, please? Looking at the fingertip. And we have here a person which is using the back drivability of the finger of the robot to show to the robot the extent to which it can move its finger and still hold uh, tightly the, the object. We have the activation here that is perceived tactile sensor uh, for, the, for the different object as we, as we displace the, the object. Can, we, can you see the slides again? Okay. So what we have here are tactile sensors at the fingertip. And as we move the finger of the, uh, of, of, of the um, of the robot, we perceive different information, tactile information here at the fingertip. So there is a change in both the perception of the force that is applied at each of the fingertip, which results from a displacement of the object, so a change of the weight of the object, and we, and we can relate now this displacement of the force, um, the displacement of the force and the displacement of the response of the tactile sensor, which we call S here, to the displacement of the, of the joints. So if we learn this as a joint probability density function, we are able to predict now what could be the optimal or this possible feasible posture of the finger given a new uh, perception of the force at the fingertip. And if we can now move to the other video, the third video, okay. So we have again this teaching, so we can extend that to teaching uh, robots to re-rotate uh, largely the finger. And here after learning, we see the robot smoothly adapts the positioning of the finger to change in the tactile response that it perceives uh, at the fingertip. So it has a very so-called compliant behavior that is the result of this teaching showing, in fact, um, a feasibility space. So as opposed to have 
an optimal uh, posture, we now show a range of feasible posture of the finger that are correlated to the, uh, to the, the response, the tactile response that we have at the fingertip. I'm going now to move to uh, the next video, which is another example of how we can teach now this range of feasibility and, and compliant control, this adaptivity to perturbation. Can we, can we play the video? So we'll get here a task which is typical of what I like robots to do in the long run. So we have a robot that is uh, carrying um, a bottle of coke and is bringing it to, uh, to a target. And if it gets perturbed on its way to the target and it's not showing the right compliance, it will start uh, pouring the liquid. So imagine that this liquid is very hot and it will be very dangerous. So what we like the robot is to be very compliant, as we see here, so to absorb the shock and to absorb them um, in a direction that is meaningful. Now, when the robot is actually pouring the liquid into the glass, that's the opposite. You like the robots to be very stiff, that means not absorb um, the perturbation and not move uh, in the direction induced by the, by the external perturbation. So how can we teach robots to be compliant in certain part of the task and not compliant in other part of the task? Um, how can we teach them to adapt uh, to this, uh, this variation in the same way as humans will naturally do? So it's inducing, in fact, this notion of what the task is about and where we can vary uh, our compliance and where we cannot. So we will do it in two different ways. We'll use a little bit this idea that if you, if you have somebody who is too stiff, you will come and, and shake the person and say, oh, come on, relax. Um, here you can be really completely unstiff uh, at the end effector. So we can come, and what we'll see here is a little ball that represents um, the, the, the stiffness. So the larger the ball, um, in fact, the more compliance you can show in one particular direction. We'll also use tactile sensing for doing the opposite. So here we have the person shaking the robot and inducing, as we shake the robot, inducing a notion that you can be very compliant in the direction in which you shake the robot. And you see this uh, increase of the ellipse represents the extent to which the robot is now allowed uh, to move uh, uh, in response to the perturbation. And so we see that we can, by rotating in all directions, teach robots to be very compliant in all directions. Using tactile sensor, we can do the opposite. It would be as if you're not compliant enough and somebody comes and press on your, on your forearm and say, no, no, now you have to be very stiff. Hold that very stiffly. And so as we press, we have this ball that reduces, meaning that you need to be extremely stiff uh, now in this, uh, in this particular uh, point in, in space. So we can do this teaching uh, using the, these two different interfaces for the task that I've shown before. So as you see here, we can combine both teaching compliance and then suddenly asking to be very stiff. And that can be done in real time as the robot is uh, performing the task. So we'll see here an example of how that can be uh, used for teaching the robot on the fly as it's performing the task. So we have, by default, a very compliant behavior, and we'll just show here the stiffening. So as the robot now is uh, pouring the liquid into the cup, we'll press uh, on, the, on the tactile interface and teach robots now to show a lot of compliance. And by moving, in fact, the target, we're teaching the robot to be very compliant at that particular point in space in the task space. That means once you're close to the target, you should be very stiff. And we see how compliant it is when we are out, away from the target and very stiff uh, when, it's, uh, when it's very close to, to the target. I think we can move to, uh, to the next, uh, next video, please. So in this other video, I'd like to show an example of uh, very compliant behavior uh, where the robot wants to uh, do a very simple task. The robots want to go to one target, which is the cup. And so it wants to drop the trigger into the cup. And so it's constantly being perturbed by a human which is touching the robot. And it moves away from the perturbation in what I would call a very natural manner. So as you can see, it's, uh, it's moving away from the contact point, not too fast, again, with the same dynamics as a, as a human will do. And it moves and it resumes the motion towards the target immediately as soon as the perturbation stops. This is typically what I like robots to be able to achieve. So we can stop the video and move back to the slide.
Okay. So how can we achieve this? And I don't want to be very technical. Just give a little bit of a hint as we can do that. Well, you've seen many examples of dynamical system, and it's been emphasized that dynamical system can be used to control robots in many different ways. So we can do it here uh, also by designing a dynamical system, which is described just by a nonlinear function f. And we can learn this nonlinear function from a couple of demonstrations. So we see here the motion flow. This is the target here. And we see that all the flow of motion brings us to the target. So it means that wherever the robot starts, for any point in space, then all these points have a trajectory that will bring them ultimately to the target. So this is a dynamical system with a single attractor, which is asymptotically stable. And so we can learn, given a couple of demonstrations, which we see overlaid here in blue, um, a notion of this nonlinear function. And once we have this nonlinear function, which we know is stable, then if we start from any point in space and we get a perturbation, as in the example I've showed before, so this perturbation is typically somebody coming and pushing the robot away from the original trajectory. Um, then the robot will simply resume the, the motion using another of the dynamics towards the target. And so this is just by querying for this function f. And this can be done in real time, and there is no time dependency. So this gives us this very flexibility that we like the robot to have, even in the face of perturbation. I'd like to show two other examples of how this can be used to teach robots to perform in a very um, flexible manner complex tasks. So if we start with the first example here, this one. Can you play the video or I play it from the slides? So here is an example where we teach robots to uh, cut ham, um, so cutting on a plane here. And you want a robot to learn that the attractor is this, particular, um, is this particular board, and it's not uh, doing the exact same motion. So once you've properly learned that the dynamics is related to this particular board, then what, can, what you can do is have the robot cut still with the same cyclic manner and adapt to motion of the board on the fly. It can even adapt to change. Um, oh, I see that there is some delay to change in the position of the board uh, or change also uh, its behavior in the face of a perturbation such as putting ham, which will uh, increase sleepiness uh, in, the, in the night. Okay. Shall we play the next video? So I'd like now to move to another example, which is the golf task. So here we can teach a robot to play golf. So here, this is a, another example where you can teach a robot uh, to sink a ball um, into, into that hole. And so by showing different demonstration, uh, you can learn the dynamics of going and hitting the ball. So we can do that by teaching both the dynamics of the end effect of motion, but also uh, controlling for the orientation and the particular speed um, when hitting the ball. And what you really want the robot to, to learn and, and to generalize over is the idea that um, this is the relative position to the ball and the, and the goal that matters. To the extent that once this is learned, can we move to the next video, please? And we can have the robot here, we see overlaid uh, different uh, reproduction. And now the robot can adapt also to sudden change in the goal location. So this is really the same principle as what I've described before. The change of the goal location is the same as moving the robot. Okay, can you please play it in the... So basically what, what you have is a, an adaptation to change in the goal, which is the same as being moved away from the goal if you place a frame of reference on the, on the final goal. So here uh, it looks like we're helping the robot and having it um, sink the ball in the goal by moving the goal to where the robot will sink it. But in fact, this is not what's happening, but it's so smooth and so subtle and so rapid that you actually don't see any change to the dynamics, and the dynamics looks very... Uh, very fluent and uh, very similar to uh, what we would expect the dynamics to look like. So the dynamics is inferred from the human motion for the demonstration we had before, and we see here um, the adaptation, the, the very rapid adaptation to change of the goal. Normally this video should show different change of the, of the goal location. I don't know why it keeps stopping uh, at the same position. Anyway, in the interest of time, I think I will wrap up. So I wanted to... Um, to re-emphasize a couple of uh, different points that are important to me. 
Furthermore, I, I like robots to have bodies that resemble our body if they are to manipulate object design for us. I truly believe that because objects are really meant for the human hands in particular, then we need to have robots that have a hand which is similar to the human hand. And again, by similar means not just the degrees of freedom, but also the size uh, so that they can handle easily uh, the, the thinness of the, of the different objects, but also the range of force they can apply. <coughs> Now, the body shapes the way we move. So because the body shapes the way we move, then humans can shape the way robots move if they have body that resembles us. And assuming that we need to have robots that have body that resembles us for the, for the, the reason that I've mentioned before, then it's important to have uh, humans that can then teach robots to do uh, motion that are similar to human motion. So there are two different ways in which we can uh, have uh, humans shape the way robots move or have robots uh, moving the same way as humans. We want robots to copy the dynamics of human motion because it will make them robust to perturbation, but most importantly to me is because it will make robots' motion more predictable and hence safer for humans uh, to interact with robots. We like to copy the way also humans adapt to perturbation. This is one step further, not having just robots moving the same way as humans do, but also having robots react the same way as humans do. So having this Flexibility means also to learn how humans react to perturbation. What does that mean? And why, why is it interesting to try to mimic the way they react? Again, because it will make the behavior more predictable, safer, and probably more optimal to perturbation, daily perturbation that we induce when we interact with robots. So I'd like to close here, and uh, I will welcome questions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Ot, thank you very, very much uh, for your presentation. I think this is the way we want to deal with robots in the future. We don't want to program them, but we demonstrate what they should be doing and then they will do it for us. Right? I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's the way we would like it uh, to have. Uh, so I will open the floor now to questions uh, from the global lecture hall. Do we have a question? Maybe I, could, I can start with one. Ah, there is one here, right here, in the Zurich, over here. Right, go ahead. I understand well the point you made about um, robots being able to manipulate um, objects, everyday objects, in our kitchens. Um, but um, Rolf, taught us a lot about emergence or about um, behavior um, that um, emerges from the robot in a, in a um, creative way. So don't you think you're trading, you're trading um, the possibility of emergent behavior for um, quality, qualities um, similar to those of humans? Um, so, or, right, or so, in in other words, don't you think, um, in theory, robots could could develop other ways um, to grasp objects, perform better than humans, even? Okay, good question. Or yeah, I think it's yeah. a good question. It, it is it is not easy to to answer this question. I know it's it's two ways of thinking. Um, in a way, that this is also the reason why people say that uh, there is no reason to have robots that have exactly the uh, the same body as humans and and the same uh, the same shape uh, of the human hands, uh, because we could find more optimal way. And then it's a question of what do you mean by optimal? Uh, are you optimizing for the number of degrees of freedom to do the same task? And it's difficult to to know what exactly we want to optimize for. Um, and how we will measure this uh, notion of uh, better or more optimal for a given task. Um, so certainly, certainly you, can, you could be able to design a hand with much more degrees of freedom. In fact, I'm thinking that the human hand is not perfect. You could have even more degrees of freedom and be more resilient to perturbation um, in, in, if that was your, your goal. Um, what I wanted to, to make as a, as a point is, is that it makes um, the task much easier if you have robots that have a hand uh, which is really similar to the human hand, um, just because we design our tool for this human hand. So in a way, if you want, there is a lot of optimization going on in the way tools are being designed for a particular device, which is the human hand. And so it will be 
it would be interesting to have robots that have uh, hands that are even more optimal, but in a way, if you've designed tools that are optimal for the human hands, then why should you have then hands that are more optimal for handling these same tools? So it's, it's sort of a, a notion of optimality. What do we mean by optimality? Uh, and I, I'm just saying that it's, it's a lot easier if we, if we have robots that resemble us just because the world that we build for us is meant for us only. Okay, thank you. So do we have another question from the Global Lecture Hall? Uh, well, maybe I can ask a question then. So it, the question is about when you say the same way as humans and the same dynamics as humans. If you look at the construction of the eye cup or of the Barrett arm, then, of course, the construction is very different from the construction, so to speak, of uh, humans. Now, even if, and I think there is a frame of reference problem, which we have been discussing a lot, even if the movement looks very much like the one of the human, the underlying mechanisms that bring about this particular movement may actually be very different. And so in that sense, the dynamics, the underlying dynamics, so to speak, is very different. In the case of golf, just reproducing the movements of a golf master, you might be learning exactly the wrong thing. Why, why would that be the wrong thing? Uh, so I, I agree well, with you, it's not going to be exactly well, because the same body, Because my body or the robot's body is different, so the robot, I think that relates to the question that uh, was asked before, because the robot's body is different, maybe its movement should also be different to perform the task. Yes, but why would you want them to be different? So I think this, uh, you know, is, is a, it's just a different way of, of thinking. Um, the, the body will be slightly different to some extent at the level of the motor on themselves, but the, the it depends what you call the dynamics. So the, the dynamics of the, the dynamics of the motion itself, so the, the development of not the motors themselves, but the, the displacement in, in position and space uh, may be extremely similar to the. Um, so this is the correspondence problem. Is basically. What do you want to be similar in the end? Is that the way you produce the movement, every single difference, the, the motors or, or, the, uh, or the final uh, position. So basically, if you and me play golf, you will play it slightly different than I would do. But we will both agree that the overall dynamics or the overall task is the same. So we achieve the same, uh, the same goal. We achieve the same overall dynamics or we induce the same dynamics on, on the ball motion, even though we may use different configuration of our muscles or I may be less strong than you are. So I, I will argue that it's true. Uh, there, there may be different dynamics, but I, and the robots will find a way of solving um, this correspondence problem that is different from the human. But ultimately, the observable dynamics should be similar. So maybe I should have been clear to that, I will, on, on that point. I okay. think that the the way that robots right. move should be similar as perceived by the human because it makes the motion more predictable. But it's true that the way the robot controls its own body is going to be different uh, from the way humans control our body. Right. Okay, so we have a question here from Zurich. Christopher, actually, Tasmania and Zurich. <laughs> I, I find this uh, discussion very interesting, and I think that's one of the best um, parts of the Shanghai lectures, that these discussions happen over you know, um, country boundaries and so on. The, there was a comment that uh, um, robots inhabit uh, an environment that is designed for human use. And while that is generally um, certainly correct, if we look at certain details, then we find a lot of um, um, examples where things haven't been designed for human use. At, at least they haven't been um, designed for smooth human use. If you see people who don't know how to open drawers because they can't find the handle because it looks better, but it makes it unusable, or if you see people that bump into um, glass doors, that has happened to me, because um, you know um, designers think that uh, doors should look great, but they are not particularly usable. And, and um, yeah, that design of artifacts, that's a little bit uh, what I'm interested in. Then um, it's, it's a very strange environment. So. There might be something that uh, robots actually get much better at using the environment that's supposedly used for, um, built for, for human use, and robots get much better at, uh, at using that. So it's, it's, um, yeah, it, it just got me thinking. So I don't have a question. It just got me thinking. 
<laughs> oh, thanks a lot. Okay. okay, you want to comment on this odd? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, that's true. I, I agree with the, the point that uh, some of the design, even though they, they are meant to, they, well, but again, this, this type of design, they, they are not meant to, to suit our needs. Huh? They are not meant to, to us, but they are meant to, to other needs, some other notion of optimality and, and makes our life uh, more difficult. Yeah, so I like the comment. Thank you. Okay, so maybe last question from the global uh, lecture hall, if there is one. Okay, well, if there, if there isn't, then I would like to thank Odd once again. And, uh, you know, as I said uh, before, I think this is the way that we should deal with robots in the future. So we're very much looking forward to your uh, research and we'll be following closely uh, the results that you're uh, achieving. Okay, so thank you again, uh, Odd. Thank you for being thank with you. us and sharing your ideas with us. Right. Thank you. Goodbye. So, right, so now.